morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Anne Britte Duva. I am head of research here at FAFO, and uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this very important and timely conference. The huge increase in the number of refugees resulting from the conflicts in the Middle East and North Africa is now uh, a lot less visible than it was in the fall of 2015. Uh, that does not mean, as all of you here probably are very well aware of, that the so-called refugee crisis is over. The crisis is still very much acute in Syria, in Turkey, in Jordan, as well as in Greece and in Italy. And one of the very worrying consequences of this is that uh, a whole generation is about to lose out on a normal childhood and adolescence. They grow up in a very poor living conditions and they lack access to schooling, education, uh, a normal interaction with other children and they also lack access to a normal family life. War is devastating in so many ways uh, in addition to the direct loss of lives and property. Today, many of these people reside in neighboring countries with very limited resources to assist them and the huge number of refugees in these countries also threatens to destabilize not only local labor markets, but also political regimes. So even though the situation may seem less dramatic now to Northern Europeans, the humanitarian crisis just outside EU borders calls for action, not only for humanitarian reasons, but also because neglecting to do so might backfire in destabilization, chaos, and a growing number of angry young men, and maybe even some angry young women, that you might meet someday. So we can all agree that some sort of action is needed, but still a number of very basic questions remain. Questions of what, when, where, and by whom. And some research in this field points to that the solution should be a combination of alternatives, a combination of assisting refugees in the neighboring countries and increased resettlement in the EU and EEA countries. Professor Susan Martin, who has led uh, a research funded by DELMI, says uh, in a, a, a DELMI report that the responsibility sharing for refugees in the Middle East and North Africa uh, uh, she says in, in, a, in a newsletter about this research that many of these MENA countries host a very large number of refugees and are asking for firm commitments both to financial assistance and increased resettlement of refugees. They also want help in finding solutions to the conflicts in the neighboring countries. She also points out that uh, their leverage, the leverage of these countries is quite small relative to the countries that hold the power uh, in, in terms of financial resources, uh, in terms of, of resettlement programs and seats uh, on the Security Council and other conflict prevention bodies. In other words, political so solutions still depend on EU institutions and EU members. So increased resettlement in the EU and EEA countries is by no means straightforward. One thing is the before-mentioned weaknesses uh, in the EU institutions, but EU members also differ substantially in financial means. They also differ in the refugees, uh, the, the attitudes of the populations, the attitudes towards refugee resettlement and immigration in general. And forcing a larger number of refugees onto these countries than there is support for in the local populations may be risky, not only for the refugee integration, but also for the EU political project. So whatever we here may feel, a democratic approach actually needs grounding in populations where the support for immigration may not be that overwhelming. And there seems now to be substantial support for the alternative of shutting down the possibility for individual asylum applications altogether and shift all refugee integration towards quotas and applications filed from abroad. Others have voiced the alternative of helping the refugees to migrate to countries outside EU, countries where they would easier fit into the local labor markets. 
It is, however, not very clear how these policy suggestions should play out and which would be the consequences for the refugees, the neighboring countries, and the EU and its member countries. Now, in the fall of 2015, the critical weaknesses of the European asylum system were uncovered, uh, but in the wake of the 2015 situation, there is now uh, a bit more room for creative thinking about alternatives, and this is the reason for why we arranged this conference. And I would like to thank the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for co-funding this event with us and thereby making this conference possible. I really look forward to hear your contributions and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. My name is Aslak Bunde. I have the pleasure to moderate today. We will speak English in this first part of the seminary and then we will switch to Norwegian after the break when we will have a debate up here about the Norwegian or the alternatives seen from the Norwegian angle. Uh, we have a, sl a small uh, change in the program actually because uh, Natasha Tsaun, she was forced to stay at home in England yesterday because she became ill. And uh, that means that we only have two distinguished uh, lecturers from abroad. But that means also that we will, they, uh, we will have more time for questions and debate after they, uh, after they have been speaking. And as you also can see in the program, uh, it is written about the lectures and also something about their uh, research. Uh, so I'm so glad that I don't have to present them very thoroughly because you can read it. So Susan Fratsky, you can come up here at once. And uh, the only thing I will say before you start speaking is that afterwards it is open for questions and remarks. And if you'd like to post them on email, you can do that also to Celia, that is S-E-S -E at fafo.no. It's written in the program also. So Susan, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much uh, and thank you for having me for this uh, very timely conversation. Um, the, the CEAS and the Common European Asylum System, of course, um, has been under pressure for, uh, for a couple of years now. And as we heard at the beginning, it's uh, not as visible as it was in, in 2015. Um, but the, there's very much a time for reform and, and a moment um, where we can step back and think about what's, what's working and what hasn't worked. Uh, and of course, within the, the context of the EU at the moment, um, there's a, a huge amount of pressure to really complete um, some level of reforms to the common European asylum system within the next six months, within the, the next presidency of the European Union. Um, but what exactly those reforms should be? Um, there's, of course, uh, proposals on the, the table from the European Union, from the European Commission of what they should look like. Um, but there's not really, as we heard at the beginning, there's, there's not really a lot of agreement yet uh, across the European Union and the associated countries of the European Union on, on what, um, what's politically feasible, feasible and what the options should look like. Um, so what I would like to, to do is to first uh, think, is take a step back and think just briefly on how we ended up where we are at the moment within the European context. Uh, and then look at, in a bit more depth, at one of the particular solutions that's been proposed uh, and, that's, and that has been um, debated quite a bit uh, over the last couple of years, and that's the issue of opening legal pathways to protection for, uh, for people who are in, in need of international protection. Uh, so first, the, the question of, of how did we get where we are now? Of course, um, we know that the, the world is facing, um, at least within, uh, you know, within the, what we know of the last 50 years, an unprecedented uh, crisis of displacement, more than 20 million people who are refugees. Um, but if you look at the, the European context in particular, uh, what Europe is, has faced is not simply a, a crisis of numbers or of displacement, but in many respects, of course, a, a policy and a, a political challenge with regard to the issue of asylum. And in Europe in particular, uh, much of the challenges lie in this marriage between the Schengen free movement system and territorial asylum and uh, how these two have been sort of placed in parallel. Um, 
the, the origins of Schengen and uh, the ability, of course, to, to cross European borders without presenting um, authorization documents uh, really has its, its origin and its basis in, in three different principles. The first, of course, is trust across EU member states that each member state will uphold their own responsibilities for managing their borders. Um, second uh, is this idea that you could protect the Schengen space and protect the space of, of free movement um, by maintaining essentially a hard external border. So the, uh, that the member states on the borders uh, and those who, of course, are also receiving um, travelers via air travel would be upholding their obligations and uh, protecting the, this, this uh, space of free movement. And third is the idea that you could harmonize standards for dealing with, with things like travel and asylum um, to avoid the issue of secondary movement. And this is really the origin of the common European asylum system. Um, while we like to think of it as this uh, sort of idealistic project of raising asylum standards across European member states, um, in practice, the origins were very, pra were very pragmatic. Um, that if you had common standards within the EU and between member states, uh, you could address this potential that um, someone might want to claim asylum in, in one member state versus another. Uh, so in essence, the, the design of the, the common European asylum system was very defensive and, and practical um, to really protect the Schengen system of free movement. At the same time, uh, the European asylum system broadly has tended to take uh, a fairly passive approach to providing protection. Um, so essentially waiting for, uh, for those in need of protection to reach European borders before, um, before going through the process of providing it. Um, and that means that, that Europe has, of course, relied on the territorial asylum system pr to provide that protection. And it's worth taking a step back and asking what do we mean, of course, by the, the territorial asylum system? Um, in essence, we mean that you must cross a border uh, and be physically present in a country to actually submit that, that claim for protection and to receive protection. Um, the challenge, of course, is that the hard border of Schengen, uh, that border that was, that was set up to protect the Schengen zone, um, plus the requirement to be territorial, territorially present to claim asylum, um, means that it's actually very difficult in practice to, to access protection um, if you don't have the ability to get a visa, which of course uh, many people from, from countries of origin that are facing conflict uh, and persecution don't have the ability to do. Uh, and that means that you have to take your, your journey into your own hands and organize your own means to reach a country where you can um, be safe from persecution and uh, begin to resume uh, a life uh, where you can uh, uh, earn your own means to a livelihood um, and uh, achieve sort of a, some semblance of a, of a normal life. Um, and within the, the context of the European Union, of course, the Dublin system creates many of the same incentives um, by, again, a, a, an instrument that was designed to protect the Schengen zone, but has created some perverse incentives in terms of, um, of course, forcing people to uh, underground to avoid uh, being sent back to countries where they don't necessarily want to, to uh, claim asylum. Uh, the result, of course, has been that within the European asylum system, most claims for protection have been processed through the spontaneous asylum system, the territorial asylum system, um, rather than uh, some of these organized legal channels that I'll talk about uh, in, in a minute. Uh, in 2016, uh, about 700,000 asylum applications were filed within the, the territory of the EU. Uh, by contrast, just over 18,000 people were actually uh, processed through the resettlement system. And of course, by resettlement, we mean uh, the system where you're actually, uh, states are actually organizing travel for someone uh, from a, a country of first asylum into a country where they can then um, find a, a durable solution and uh, permanent legal status. And of those 700,000, if you actually filed asylum applications within the, the Dublin Associated States and the member states of the European Union, um, we, while the data doesn't allow us to necessarily break out exactly how each, each of those people uh, were able to enter the, the territory of the, the EU, 
Um, it's safe to assume that most uh, had to do so without authorization, so had to cross a, a border without um, receiving a visa, uh, and in most cases that means place themselves at the, the mercy of a smuggler, um, which of course exposes you to any number of dan dangers uh, in the journey along the way. So why, why is this a problem? Why is relying on this, this system, um, what challenges is it creating? Of course, we know that uh, requiring people to organize their own journeys, place themselves at the mercy of smugglers, is incredibly dangerous. Um, we, within the, the last six months, we've seen uh, the consequences in Libya in particular. Um, women, uh, of course, being uh, placed in, in dangerous situations where they're vulnerable of rape, um, human trafficking. Um, it's uh, incredibly dangerous for the people involved, not to mention, of course, the, the dangers of actually crossing the Mediterranean uh, and placing yourself, uh, of course, at the, at the mercy of the weather and uh, uh, the, the rickety boats that, that people end up traveling on. There's also, of course, the, the challenges that this creates for the highly complex asylum systems of Europe. Um, in a, a system that is providing such a, a high level of, of care and uh, it, undergoes, uh, requires individual status determinations along the way. Uh, it's very difficult, of course, to process such a high number of people. And we saw this, of course, in, in 2015 and the delays and complications that this created. Um, and of course, also, as we, we heard at the beginning, there's the, the risk that uh, there's a feeling of a loss of control um, that comes with a high number of, of spontaneous asylum applications. So what, um, what are some of the solutions that have been considered? Of course, one of the most debated solutions is the, the possibility to connect people with a legal pathway to protection um, that would allow them to, uh, to avoid these dangerous journeys. The idea, of course, is that by providing people with a, a legal pathway to actually access asylum and access protection, um, you would allow them to bypass the, the need for these dangerous journeys, prevent some of the, the strains on the spontaneous asylum system, and place more control back in the hands of uh, the, the governments who are responsible then for providing that protection and avoid uh, something of, of a populist backlash um, that of course everyone has been very concerned about uh, in the context of European elections in the last few years. And in many ways it seems like this is um, where Europe may be headed, uh, a movement away from territorial asylum to a more resettlement-based system, a system where governments are actively organizing journeys for refugees and those in need of protection from first asylum countries where they fled immediately after uh, conflict um, to countries in Europe and elsewhere where they can find uh, a longer term solution, permanent residency, eventually citizenship, uh, and begin to rebuild their lives. The idea, of course, has featured very prominently among national governments and at the EU level, as well as within international organizations. Um, the European Commission's 2015 Agenda on Migration mentioned the issue of legal pathways as a, a way to address the pressures that the European asylum system was facing at that time. Um, it was a main, uh, a main thrust of the, the, council, uh, the council's response within 2015, of course, uh, again, in July of 2015, uh, the Council of the European Union introduced a pilot program for resettlement um, that was designed to, to essentially do the same thing, to begin to bring some order into the, the system that uh, people were using to access protection within the EU. And that scheme introduced the possibility of uh, 20,000 resettlement places being spread out across the, the European Union. Uh, and those places have now, for the most part, been filled. So the, the EU has actually quite already begun to step up its commitment in the area of asylum. There's also now the, the proposal for a common EU resettlement framework um, that would begin to align resettlement activities across EU member states uh, and provide a, a common, uh, common set of standards and a common set of priorities across the European Union for actually um, resettling people from first asylum countries. Um, the idea has been endorsed by national leaders within the EU. Of course, um, French President Emmanuel Macron has uh, called for the introduction of legal pathways, um, not specifically resettlement, but the idea of uh, extraterritorial processing. So the idea that you could process um, asylum applications outside 
of Europe and then begin to bring people in, uh, in through that route. And even um, the UN uh, Refugee Agency, UNHCR, has also um, begun to endorse the idea of alternative legal pathways to protection uh, in several of, of their high-level conferences in the last couple of years. But it's worth taking a step back and asking, what are we saying when we talk about legal channels to protection? Um, there are a lot of different things that fall under this category. Uh, and I think there's a, not always a lot of clarity uh, about what exactly we're talking about when we talk about legal channels to protection. Um, there's, a, I think, three different categories that you could really, uh, really identify. The first is channels that serve as a, a durable solution to protection. Um, this has traditionally been resettlement. Uh, when we talk about durable solutions for, for those who are displaced, we're usually talking about uh, resettlement in a third country, return to the country of origin, or local integration. And um, resettlement, while the smallest of those three, um, has, uh, of course, been um, the, the main durable solution channel that has uh, existed for many people. Um, return numbers have, have been low in the, the last several decades. Uh, local integration in the first country of asylum for many people is, uh, is not really a possibility um, given the, the, re the restrictions on the right to work and gain legal residency. Um, so resettlement has is, is been the, the legal pathway to protection that has really been, uh, been at the heart of, of legal avenues to protection over the last few decades. Um, it's been a major part, of course, of the protection and asylum systems in uh, countries like Canada and Australia and the United States, the, the major three players in the area of, of resettlement. Um, Norway, though, of course, and uh, Sweden and Finland have also played a, a major role within the resettlement system, resettling uh, several thousand people per year. Um, resettlement is, is distinct from what we talk about when we talk about uh, other legal pathways because it generally is understood to involve a, a pathway to permanent residency or citizenship. So this means because it's a, a durable solution, you're actually providing a long-term uh, long solution for someone who is resettled and a permanent, um, a permanent status. Also under the category of, of this durable solutions, we could consider things like uh, private sponsorship of refugees. And this is an idea that's really come to the fore um, because of uh, activism on the, the part of uh, the Canadian government in particular and uh, a number of different organizations, um, particularly in the European space over the last uh, couple of years. The idea behind private sponsorship is that you actually have communities and individuals who are able to come together and uh, approach a government and say, um, we are willing to, to come forward and care for, uh, for a, a refugee if you are able to get that person to our country. So it's actually individuals and private organizations coming forward and taking some responsibility for providing protection. Um, in some cases, that's in addition to traditional resettlement channels. Uh, in other cases, it may be within the context of the, the usual resettlement system, um, but providing complementary uh, protection capacity to what the government is able to provide. Um, the second category of legal channels uh, that we talk about is channels to respond to uh, urgent needs or, or channels that are, are deployed um, without the, the broader context of a, a resettlement system. Um, it's a way to respond rapidly, uh, quickly to a rapidly changing situation. And the idea is to really um, move people as, as quickly as possible to some place where they could be safe. Uh, and then eventually, perhaps they'll return to their country of origin. Within this category, we can talk about things like humanitarian admission programs. Um, these were deployed, of course, during uh, the immediate aftermath of the Iraq war. Uh, where uh, Germany, for example, offered uh, an ad hoc humanitarian admission scheme for Iraqi refugees on the understanding that they would provide safety for, uh, for people and, and perhaps eventually once the situation stabilized, they would return. Um, the same thing has been done uh, in the, the wake of the Syrian refugee crisis with a number of different European countries introducing ad hoc humanitarian protection schemes um, to allow people to reach safety. Uh, again, Germany introduced a scheme for 20,000 people. Um, unlike resettlement, humanitarian admission usually involves a time-limited status. So in the context of the German program, visas were 
uh, available only for the, the period of two years um, and don't provide uh, access to permanent residency or citizenship, although that may change. But again, the, the idea is that it's a, a short-term uh, a, a short term solution and something that can be scaled up and set up very quickly. Uh, the second uh, type of channel that falls in this category of urgent needs is the area of humanitarian visas and external processing. And this is the, the thing that's, I think, attracted a lot of attention also within the European space. Of course, um, President Macron had talked about the idea of doing external processing from uh, centers in Niger or elsewhere in Africa. The idea that outside of a, a set quota program, like you would normally see in the context of resettlement, you would actually allow someone who's in need of protection to approach some sort of a, a center or an embassy elsewhere in the world and submit the asylum claim. But the idea is that that process would then be taken uh, care of outside of, of the territory of the EU, and then that person would be allowed entry. The, the final basket of channels that we can talk about is channels that enable people to take advantage of existing mobility opportunities. And that's uh, things like work visas. So uh, an NGO that's based in, in Washington DC, Talent Beyond Boundaries, for example, has been working on um, enabling refugees who uh, have qualifications and would normally be able to access work visas abroad, particularly in places like Canada and Australia that have extensive high-skilled immigration systems, um, enabling them to get the documents that they need to actually access those opportunities. Within that same category is uh, student visas, so actually enabling refugees to, um, to access opportunities for higher education uh, elsewhere. Um, the World University of Service of Canada, for example, uh, mobilizes students to provide scholarship funds to refugees um, that they can then use to study at a Canadian university. Uh, so the private funding is, is used to allow students to fund their education and support themselves while they're in Canada. And of course, this third basket um, of existing mobility options uh, is likely to be small in numbers, but I think the, the important thing is the important element is allowing people to access opportunities that they would normally already be eligible for if it weren't for their, um, their status as, as someone who's been displaced. Each of these three different channels, so channels that serve as a durable solution, channels that address urgent or, or unforeseen needs, and channels that actually allow people to take advantage of existing mobility options, has found uh, vocal public champions, I think, in different places in Europe over the last two years. And I see them at least as, as very important tools, um, in part because they look beyond Europe's borders to try to find a solution to this challenge, beyond the issue of responsibility sharing and the Dublin regulation and sort of small tweaks to, to legislation, um, to actually begin to address this fundamental tension between uh, trying to protect the Schengen zone and whether or not someone can actually gain a pathway to protection. Um, yet, I think in order to uh, have these, these different channels actually become realistic possibilities, I think there are a few different points that, that we need to bear in mind when we talk about legal channels. First, I think it's important to be very clear about what it's actually possible to achieve. Uh, too often, I think a, a lot of um, references to legal channels uh, tend to be very vague. Uh, and, and simply talk about a solution being opening legal pathways to protection as a way to reduce spontaneous flows without really thinking about what, what that means and what the likely consequences of that may be in practice. Um, we know uh, from, from uh, you know, all the research that's been done in the context of migration over the last decades that when people make decisions about whether or not to move, they're doing so on a highly complex basis. Uh, it's very difficult and, and in fact impossible to really predict whether or not someone will move or where on uh, the basis of a simple calculus. And, and I think a lot of times the, the discussion around legal channels simply assumes that if you provide enough legal opportunities, um, someone will uh, you know, choose to, to wait for resettlement rather than trying to take a boat across the, the Mediterranean to Europe. Um, but, but as I said, we actually know very little about how people make those decisions and even indeed about how people are accessing uh, the EU to claim asylum. Uh, we did a, a report last year looking at what we know about how people are, are moving into Europe and discovered that, of course, the, the data as in many areas of um, migration research is extremely thin. Uh, so I think it's, it's a bit simplistic to think about offering a, a small number, a few additional thousand resettlement places really reshaping the decisions that people make uh, when they're trying to seek protection. Uh, 
That means that uh, you really can't do, even though it's difficult to talk about, you can't do uh, greater numbers of, of legal pathways to protection without at the same time ensuring that you're doing due diligence in the area of, of border control and actually enforcing immigration regulations. Um, legal channels to protection are one part of the, the protection framework and, and protection toolbox, uh, but actually managing migration and managing borders and, and immigration enforcement must then be uh, another part of that toolbox. Second, I think uh, we need to think strategically about how we're deploying legal channels to protection and, and what it is that we're actually trying to achieve in using these channels. Each of the different channels that I, that I outlined within these three categories uh, can serve a, a particular role and a particular added value within the context of a broader protection system. Um, but I think uh, too often we deploy them reactively uh, and, and governments have a tendency to use them in the sense that um, I need to do something, so let's have a humanitarian admissions program. Um, and while it's, it's important, uh, of course, to, to use the impetus that's created by a crisis to think of a new solution, uh, I think it's also important to take a step back and uh, think about what we're trying to achieve and what, which of these tools might be best suited to achieve that goal and best uh, suited to a particular context. Um, there are different reasons to actually deploy legal channels. Of course, uh, the, simply because it's the, the right thing to do as uh, high-income countries uh, to, to take our, our place within the protection system and actually uh, take on responsibilities. Um, you might deploy a legal channel in order to uh, improve, try to improve conditions within a first asylum country by removing some of the, the responsibilities on that country uh, or as a, a tool to try to convince a, a first asylum country diplomatically to institute particular changes. Um, but in figuring out what, what tool to use where, I think it's important to think about, uh, as I said, questions of scale and what it is that you're actually trying to achieve. Uh, and within the European context, a lot of the, the discussion has been around how European countries, of course, can come together um, and try to, to pool some of their resources to use uh, things like resettlement or uh, humanitarian admission a bit more strategically to try to achieve particular goals. Uh, at the same time, I think the, the other final piece that, that we need to keep in mind is that legal pathways for, to protection are not a replacement for the territorial asylum system. They're one tool within that context. Uh, I think territorial asylum still plays a critical role within the, within the global protection system. Um, despite everything I just said about trying to uh, think ahead and actually to plan, uh, plan for and, and use things like legal pathways more strategically, um, it's not possible, no government anywhere can ever predict exactly what challenges a, a protection system is going to face or what needs there may be, and it's important to still have that, uh, that individual ability to access protection that was really the basis of the 1951 Refugee Convention uh, and that still uh, you know, provides the ability for someone with a very individual fear of persecution to access that protection. So, it's, again, one component of this larger toolkit, uh, and it can't, while it can begin to address some of the challenges that the European asylum system faces uh, with this tension between Schengen and territorial asylum, it's not a replacement for territorial asylum. And finally, I would just say, I think um, oftentimes when we, when we look at the issue of legal pathways, we tend to think that there may be this technical solution to what's, in essence, a political problem, particularly within the European context. Um, many of the challenges are, are political issues between member states. And in the end, while we can, uh, we can explore things like legal pathways to protection as a way to begin to address that problem, the decision will ultimately be a, a political one and will need to be one that's implemented with um, the political backing of the member states uh, and national governments um, from each country. So I think we, we have to be careful not to necessarily fall into the, the trap of thinking that we'll be able to to legislate our way out of this through a, a very technical solution. But thank you. Thank you very much. Then we will wait for questions and we will have Niklas from here at once. And then after that, we will ask you to come up here. So Niklas from here, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Asla. Okay, thanks very much uh, for this um, invitation to uh, speak. Let me sort of
try to broaden out the discussion beyond Europe to a kind of uh, global sweep, so including Europe, but taking a more uh, global perspective. Can people hear okay at the back? Yeah. Um, and also perhaps just a, a historical sweep as well, and just invite you to hold in your mind as I'm talking this image of Thomas More's Utopia, uh, which marked its uh, 500th anniversary a couple of years ago. Uh, this famous text on uh, uh, utopia. And in uh, coining that term, uh, even though he was a kind of humorless cleric, uh, Thomas More was having a little uh, intellectual joke because utopia can mean both no place that is to say, an, a state which is impossible to achieve, but it can also mean a good place, a good society. So bear in mind that uh, little uh, pun, if you like, uh, as I speak. So we can be perhaps... Um, does this... Oh, okay. uh, that one should, we should be wary, perhaps, of too much... Uh, t crisis talk, we're talking about crisis all the time, but perhaps it's fair to say that a large part of the recent uh, refugee and migration crisis is a crisis of confidence in the current uh, migration and refugee re uh, regime, the, the, ar the architecture, if you like, to address uh, mobility. It's no longer believed to be up, up to the task. And the conventional three durable solutions, which Susan referred to, uh, local integration, uh, repatriation of refugees or their resettlement in a third country, seem tired and not up to the uh, job on the scale needed. And we're talking, if, as you know, about something like 65 million people displaced either within their countries or outside their, their countries of origin, not to mention a much larger population of people moving for mixed motivations, maybe mixture of conflict, betterment, and so on. And as the slide shows, there are serious um, uh, constraints and limits on the three durable solutions, I've listed some there, economic, institutional, and above all, at the moment, political, as, as we all know, the political constraints on realizing any of these durable solutions. And moreover, in any case, they provide only a, a, an answer for only a small proportion of the world's displaced, the vast majority of whom exist for years or even uh, decades in so-called uh, protracted uh, displacement, a kind of state of limbo in camps or, or self-settled in cities, enduring uh, precarious and constrained uh, conditions, not being able to make a life for themselves and so on. And as you all probably know, the UN is currently steering the international community towards so-called global compacts on uh, migration and refugees, degree, uh, due to be agreed by the end of this year. But many doubt, including myself, that uh, on past record that much will come of all this talk. Just imagine the amount of air miles and per diems that have been burnt up in the course of these uh, meetings on these global compacts. So you can see I'm a little bit skeptical of them. So against this uh, background, a number of radical, not to say um, outlandish or fantastic, um, crazy proposals have, been, have emerged to attempt to resolve uh, my refugee and migration um, challenges. And new nations, uh, new uh, cities, city-states, free zones, and other kinds of haven for, for refugees have been proposed. And uh, in the longer version of this presentation, I go into uh, some of these, uh, mainly proposed by billionaire, billionaires who've turned into kind of philanthropists, by the way. But let me just give you a, a, a flavor of uh, one of these, perhaps the most uh, exotic and strange one, a uh, proposal by a Dutch architect called Theo Deutinger, uh, who proposes this notion of Europe in Africa, and that the idea of creating an artificial island between Tunisia and Italy, 
Perhaps we could tow Boris Johnson out there and use him as part of the foundation for this island. Um, uh, on which uh, uh, right, uh, migrants and refugees would be who are passing through North Africa or, or across the, the Sahara through North Africa could be uh, uh, accommodated. And this would be in, his, in the Deutinger vision, uh, funded by the European Union, uh, creating a new country, if you like, a kind of city-state with its own constitution, economy, social system, and so on, under the protection of the European uh, uh, Union. Um, and he even provides us with a kind of um, image of this, um, of this island, uh, which, as you can see, draws on bits of Paris. Oxford University is there. Uh, not Oslo, sorry. Uh, Paris, uh, Ca Casablanca, ne bits of Niger, Berlin, Rotterdam, and so on. And bizarrely, London Airport, which I wouldn't have thought <laughs> is uh, the, the best bit of London to, to draw on. So these uh, suggestions... Uh, particularly the idea of refugee islands, as I say, proposed often by billionaires turned uh, philanthropists, have usually been dismissed out of hand by the refugee commentariat, if you like, the people who in the refugee and migration business, including myself. And indeed, mixing migration, uh, islands, enclaves, and so on, has a very bad press. If you think of Nauru, Christmas Island, um, Manus Island, Guantanamo Bay, places that are typically, uh, that typically bring associations of containment and, and incarceration. And moreover, many of these proposals come from uh, people who envisage deregulated spaces, the, the kind of dream, um, dream spaces of neoliberal zealots. They will be deregulated uh, and so on. But despite all these, um, uh, all these caveats, perhaps um, some, there is something in them that we could uh, look at. And together with my colleague Robin Cohen, we've reviewed a number of these proposals and looked at if there is anything in them and kind of rejected them but come up with a, a different uh, version, a transnational polity not a nation state, but a transnational polity, which we call refugia. And let me kind of sketch out uh, what this uh, polity would look like. <clears throat> and in the longer version, I sort of project ahead to the year 2030 when this uh, polity has been established. So unlike most of the recent proposals, uh, refugia would not be a new nation state located on an island or, a, um, or some other singular territory, if you like, but a transnational polity, which we see as emerging from the connections built up by refugees themselves with the help of uh, sympathizers, sympathetic citizens. It would be confederal in character and governed by refugees themselves. And perhaps the best analogy is with a, a kind of loosely connected archipelago that brings together refugee communities in regions in conflict, those in uh, neighboring or transit uh, countries, and refugees in more distant uh, countries of settlement, often in the global north. And we, te we call this approach a kind of pragmatic utopianism, going back to the initial slide there. And we see refugee as being the outcome of a grand bargain, if you like, between richer states and uh, so-called emergent countries, countries neighboring conflicts, and crucially, crucially, refugees themselves. So the constituent territories of refugia would in effect be licensed by the nation states uh, within whose territories they, they lie. The constituent uh, territories of refugia, of the refugia polity, would be self-governing and eventually self-supporting. Refugia as a whole would be governed by a transnational virtual assembly elected by refugians, the people of refugia, from all the constituent uh, components of the global polity. And there would also be uh, assemblies in each uh, refugee location to contribute to that global representation and to communicate the concerns of refugians to the host uh, 
uh, society and vice versa, the host society concerns to ref refugee. So refugians would be able to move amongst the different parts of refugee and where, where it's negotiated uh, between refugee and the host uh, states. So some uh, refugians might uh, live in discrete territories or spaces. Others could live side by side with citizens, especially in, large, in our large uh, metropolitan cities. Moreover, and this is an, an, uh, an important point, uh, the citizens of so-called host societies could become refugees if they wished. And we anticipate that many uh, would do so uh, as they seek alternative forms of living to those that obtain, particularly in authoritarian societies, uh, that hold sway in much of the world. And of course, you must bear in mind that uh, um, authoritarianism is the, uh, the norm in the world, not uh, liberal democracies. So as well as those displaced by conflict, refugee would attract those who want to escape various forms of um, uh, authoritarianism. What about the um, e refugee uh, economy? Well, this would build on the skills of refugees in digital communication, or, or commerce and services, cultural and creative industries, uh, education, and other uh, fields. And by mutual agreement, refugees might work in host, the kind of host state uh, proper. Refugees would pay taxes to the nation states within, uh, whose, uh, with, within whose territories they, they live, but also to the wider refugee polity. And a, a portion of that uh, revenue, that latter revenue, would provide support for poorer parts of refugee, similar in a way to the way in which remittances operate now. So there would be a means of cross subsidy across the differently endowed uh, parts of refugee. So it would be a kind of a pragmatic arrangement, which, and, and this will be perhaps the most uh, part most difficult to swallow, it will be, could be seen as a kind of secession by uh, mutual agreement. So for their part, uh, states could see it as in their interest to shuffle off the displacement uh, problem or challenge to be managed by the displaced themselves, while those who are displaced and those seeking, seeking an alternative to authoritarianism would relish the prospect of a self-managed new society that they create to themselves. So the upshot would be that refugees are no longer primarily the responsibility of the nation state that hosts them, that is to say the, in which territory they lie, but of a more diffuse uh, entity, refugee. So, um, I suppose I know the, what's sort of going through your, your mind at the moment. Uh, why, is the, why are these guys from Oxford talking about islands and utopias and um, transnational polities and, and whatnot? What, what on earth is happening over there? First they invent Brexit and now refugee. <laughs> so, now I'm going to compound that uh, thought by suggesting to you that refugee already exists in the uh, transnational, uh, imperfectly in a kind of in a prefigurative form in the uh, transnational practices of refugees and migrants themselves. And I'll just make briefly uh, make the case for this assertion. So in, in the countries that host uh, large numbers of refugees, and will likely do so for the future, foreseeable future, I'm thinking of places like Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon, um, Iran, parts of sub, sub, uh, Kenya, other, Ethiopia, and so on. Uh, refugees have established tenuous communities against the odds of challenging conditions and poor prospects. And these populations, as you know, have uh, links with more fortunate kin and friends in global cities further afield, not just in uh, the neighborhoods of New York, uh, London, Paris, Berlin, Toronto and so on, but of Istanbul, uh, Cairo, Nairobi, and, and so on, and many others in the emerge, so-called emerging and uh, emerging world, where people of diverse 
uh, ethnicities and backgrounds are thrown together, if you like, to, and live together. Indeed, in some cases, the diasporic populations in the big metropolises outside the homeland are larger or are as large or even larger than the population at home. So to take one example, Toronto's uh, Sri Lankan Tamil uh, population is at least double that of Jaffna, the main uh, uh, Tamil uh, city in Sri Lanka itself. So one could say that the center of gravity of many of the world's ethno-national groups, if you like, that have become diasporized, uh, lie outside the uh, country of origin. So, in other words, these di diasporic communities already inhabit the kind of transnational space that we envisage as, uh, as refugees. So, taken together, uh, people in these dispersed locations uh, constitute mutually supportive transnational communities through their, uh, their, their diasporic connections. And transnationalism, sort of cross-border activity, is what displaced uh, and dispersed people do to make a, a life uh, worth living. As for governance, many or several diaspora groups have created transnational governance bodies that could serve as partial models for uh, the kind of governance we envisage in this refugee transnational polity. So again, the Tamils have created what they call a transnational government of Tamil Elam. Uh, what it does isn't very good, but the, I'm talking about the actual form of it. So for example, the, the, this assembly is elected by uh, Tamils in about 15 different diaspora locations where there, where there are large uh, uh, Tamil populations. As for finance, um, I've already made passing reference to uh, remittances by refugees to their troubled homelands and regions. In effect, that distribution of uh, remittances is a, is a kind of global redistribution of wealth that is kind of akin to taxation. And a kind of proto refugee also exists in the realm of culture, seen in the transnational uh, mobility of art, music, dance, uh, language, and support, and sport. So to give uh, a very small example, you may remember that there was a refugee team in the uh, Olympics, the 2016 Olympics. Um, I think the first time in which uh, uh, people were uh, allowed to participate without uh, a national uh, affiliation. And other forms of uh, imperfect and partial refugee, if you like, uh, exist in other kinds of uh, manifestations. So I've listed some here, uh, various forms of cities and havens, little mini refugees, which I'll perhaps give an example of, uh, various enclaves, uh, autonomous regions, and so on, that um, uh, accommodate refugees. So to, just to um, concentrate on cities, perhaps, um, thinking of refugee cities, both in the sense of metropolises um, or metropolitan centers that host large communities of refugees and migrants, and also cities in the sense of these large camps that we all know have formed Zatari and, and so on in, in, in Jordan, uh, where these settlements have kind of taken on a life of their own and become, um, become cities. And in, in the longer version of this, I distinguish between kind of, kind of neoliberal uh, versions of these refugee cities and more commu communitarian uh, 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 versions of it. So one can think of Barcelona where the administration there uh, developed um, uh, various uh, means of welcoming refugees. Camp Domiz is a uh, camp in uh, uh, mainly of Syrian refugees in uh, northern Iraq which has become a community in, in its own right. And one can go down to the local level, so this place called Riace in uh, southern Italy, the uh, uh, depopulating uh, village or community that was dying, basically, the mayor there, uh, the far-sighted mayor there, uh, welcomed some several hundred uh, refugees there from about 20 different um, 
um, <coughs> uh, uh, of 20 different nationalities, and that has breathed life into this uh, depopulating or formerly depopulating um, uh, community, apparently without much um, um, uh, tension between uh, the newcomers and the hosts. Significant too uh, are the cross-ethnic and cross-national affinities that uh, have emerged among uh, people on the move. And uh, a couple of Greek uh, researchers have called this the, the mobile commons. And by this they mean activities which bring together uh, migrants and refugees drawn from different nationalities and uh, uh, ethnicities into ephemeral communities in the course of movement itself. And we can look at uh, various examples of this, um, often backed up by social media and so on. So one little uh, small example is this uh, squatting of vacant hotels in parts of Athens. Uh, the, the most uh, well-known case is the City Plaza Hotel in uh, Athens, which is squatted or occupied by uh, housing activists and uh, refugees. But I've chosen this one because Hotel Oniro uh, suits my, the name suits my purposes because Oniro in Greek means dream. So, and you can see there a commentary, a blog, by actually a Palestinian guy who uh, was part of this um, occupation of this um, hotel where there is a kind of experiment in uh, communal living. So a kind of mini version of what we're, what we're trying to get at. So um, camps and communities in uh, countries neighboring uh, conflict, neighborhoods in global cities, uh, transnational political practices and money transfers, um, emergent uh, communities and activities in disparate locations en route, initiatives by citizens and uh, community groups, including the, the private sponsorship that Susan uh, referred to, for example. All of these are fragments um, in disparate uh, locations that taken separately uh, don't seem to promise much on their own. But our point is that uh, in the aggregate, they could uh, add up to what we're calling refugia imperfectly prefigured. And consolidating them into a common transnational polity might prove uh, a way out of the uh, current impasse. So in our vision, uh, refugia will come about incrementally and cumulatively by the collective activity of refugees, uh, other kinds of migrants, and sympathetic citizens organizing in the interstices of the nation state system and the international uh, uh, migration governance architecture, if you like. Critics will no doubt and have already dubbed this uh, vision as utopian, going back to the original slide, and that critique we readily accept, uh, though with the qualification that refugia embodies a kind of pragmatic utopianism, a utopia that might actually happen, which squares the apparently contradictory and at times antagonist antagonistic interests of host states and communities and uh, refugians. So I end there with a viva refugia. Then we will put up a microphone here, and you can, if you just can stand around this table, I think. And Nick and Susan. Thank you very much. There are so many questions to ask, and um, uh, I, I have many of them. Are there anyone in the audience who would like to ask questions at once, uh, or have any remarks at once? Uh, and. I understand that because, of course, we are here because we would like to have some creative thinking. We would like to uh, 
to be uh, to look for new solutions, and then we should not be very critical. <laughs> but listening to you, <laughs> uh, many questions arise. Uh, I will come to you, Susan, but start with Nick because uh, uh, what about the? It's pragmatic, you say, but what you're feeling? What will the politicians say? I, for example, your um, when you. When you show us the Ta Tamil or, uh, Association, the transatlantic or transnational, uh, of course, the authorities in Sri Lanka they don't want anything like that. They are, we can see in Turkey how they actually fight against the Turks in the United mm -hmm. States. Is it? Are there any political possibilities that something like this can happen? This was a kind of. Uh, <laughs> I tried to be optimistic and very. Uh, Listening mm -hmm. to you, yeah. Do you want me to respond yeah. or collect uh, questions? Or? Yeah, okay. I oh, actually oh. start up responding yeah, at okay. once. Yeah. Well, I'll just uh, maybe address that one. You're talking about politicians in the origin countries or in the so-called host Both countries? Both places, yes. because okay. in the origin countries they are so strong. We can look at Turkey then. Mm -hmm. uh, they are so strong, uh, yeah. have so much power, so yeah, they yeah, will yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, uh, yeah. stop the yeah. other politicians. Well, our, the our uh, uh, view is that, well, uh, as I said, the in the sort of longer version of this, I present a kind of vision ahead to the year 2030. And what we kind of envisage is a kind of socio-political movement which embraces this idea of refugee, which is developed cumulatively. So different parts of what we call refugee link up together. Uh, and as that cumulative process uh, occurs, uh, this is in the realms of fantasy, of course, uh, or, or maybe a pragmatic fantasy. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, real, the, the, the prospect of this, the formation of this polity becomes more, more realistic. And our argument, and probably this is the most, uh, one of the more difficult parts to swallow, is that uh, polity or governments, states, politicians, and so on, in both uh, origin countries and um, uh, host states might welcome this idea of being able to shuffle off their responsibility, which we don't see anyone taking up in any case, uh, for displacement, mm -hmm. and that the displaced themselves, the dispersed, would relish the, the uh, possibility of forming a new uh, kind of society, joined by, in some cases, citizens from those uh, host states. Mm -hmm. Mm. And the host states, of course, are not only northern or the global north, the prosperous countries, mm. but also places like Turkey, um, the various African states that I mm. mentioned, Jordan, Lebanon, and so on. Yeah. And of course, there are no very good alternatives, so that this might be the best and by alternative. The, uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, there are no very good alternatives, so no, 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 this no. may no. be the best um, one. Yeah. And also, uh, just another another point, we see refu or membership of refugees as being voluntary, so it would not be a compulsory thing. So people who didn't want to opt for the refugee option, if you like, mm. could take their chances with the um, existing system, whatever it is mm. by then, but the existing uh, asylum process based on the nation state system. So this uh, entity, this transnational polity would emerge in the interstices, in the gaps mm -hmm. in the uh, na nation state mm -hmm. system, if yeah. you like. We will open up for the audience, but uh, just Susan, we will take you a little bit closer to him. So uh, what do you think actually about his, about uh, refugia? Be honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I think, uh, I mean, I think when we're looking at, um, I mean, one of the challenges when you're looking at the, to come back to the idea of the, the legal pathways and something that I think is an interesting overlap with um, this idea is the, sorry, am I, I'm a bit far from the microphone, um, is the, the fact that, I mean, when, you're, when you become displaced, you, you lose a whole set of, of rights, of course, that are um, you know, rights in terms of, of your access to work, access to education, all of these sorts of, of things, and uh, you know, rights that come with your legal status. You also lose 
in essence, the right to move uh, because you, in many cases, you may have left uh, without a passport, without your documentation, without all these other things that, that allow you this, this access to mobility that would normally come with your, um, I mean, it varies, of course, for different nationalities, but would come with your, your rights under the, the protection of a nation state. And I think this sort of idea where you're looking at, at transnational solutions that allow people to, to access some of those rights that, that allow you to, to move in a way that, um, that, that allows you to exercise your, your previous sort of right to, to mobility and to, to find protection and, and take your future into your own hands is, is very interesting. And I think there's, a, there's an overlap there. Um, and I, I think that's sort of where we need to, well, perhaps we, we won't um, end up with a, with a fully transnational refugee entity in, um, in the near future. I think looking at ways to um, provide people with some of those, those rights, whether it's through sort of a transnational recognition. I think um, you mentioned Nansen passports. Um, which was uh, in, in one of your, your papers, um, which is the, the passport uh, that was given to refugees before the, the Refugee Convention to allow them to move freely. Um, those sorts of tools that we can use to, to begin to give people a bit more autonomy and, and allow them to, to behave in a, a more sort of regular way as you would um, as a, someone with a, your, your own nationality. Uh, access to the protections of your nationality is an interesting concept. Mm. A good it uh, yeah. Thank you for two thought-provoking, very interesting presentations, both of you. Uh, I have a question for each of you. Um, let's start then with the refugee uh, idea first. Um, I have to admit that uh, I liked having been to a couple of refugee camps myself for the last. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Do you do you hear? No, I think. We should turn it on. Yeah. <laughs> and when you use the microphone, it's yeah. like singing. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's on. Very yeah. close, yeah. yeah. Um, good. Uh, I've been to a couple of refugee camps myself uh, throughout the last decade. And uh, I have to admit, I like the idea of refugee, the, the notion of it, because acknowledging that uh, refugee settlements tend to become permanent, they tend to be long term, and you have all of these refugees without any political and economic rights living there. And kind of thinking out aloud how to make, uh, to accommodate uh, people's need to have some kind of right and some kind of belonging, I think it's an interesting notion. However, the idea of a polity without territory. Uh, I'm struggling to see how that can actually be done because people do have need to have a place to live and people live and organize their lives from. And from that perspective, I saw you mention Bekaa Valley as an example. The Bekaa Valley mm -hmm. uh, in Lebanon, which is the border area in Lebanon to Syria, where this, you have had large Palestinian refugee populations for a long time and now where, where you have quite a lot of Syrians coming in these days. And you mentioned that as an example of where you get a development of uh, refugee, refugee idea, you might say. However, I also think that, that this is illustrating of the dilemma, because being one of the most fertile areas of Lebanon, it's definitely an area where I'd never think Lebanon would ever accept anybody else having any political influence on that from an external part. If you can comment on kind of the notion of not having a territorial control of mm -hmm. the areas where the refugees actually live, although they, in practical terms, they might control it, but allowing that control, the takeover of control, I think would be the main challenge. Uh, also, um, for the European uh, system, uh, I'm thinking how plausible is it that we actually can come to a common solution in Europe on legal ch channels, because there are quite a few of the member states that are definitely reluctant of having any refugees at all, I would say, and it would need to have, to find a common ground would probably be the, the worst, or, or the, the lowest number of migrants possible, or would there be any at all? So just wanting you to, to say, 
we can talk about having legal channels and common European systems, but how plausible is it that you actually will get an agreement mm. on that within the European system? Mm. I think Susan will start on the politic, the realism, political. Sure. So I think um, I, mean, I think I'm I'm very much a realist about the the prospect of having a, a common European approach to legal channels and. I think what, what we're looking at realistically in the, the next few years at least is uh, sort of coalitions of, of the willing sort of within the, the area of legal channels. So um, member states, so for example, in the context of the, the EU resettlement regulation, I mean, one of the proposed EU resettlement regulation, one of the, the, the key debates is whether or not this participation should be mandatory or whether or not it should be voluntary. I think realistically, we'll probably end up with uh, a regulation where participant in participation in resettlement is voluntary. Um, so member states who are willing to take on more responsibility for legal channels are those that, that do so. Um, and I, th I think that at least in the short term, that's not necessarily a, a problem. Um, realistically, if you look at where countries have engaged in, in resettlement or in re relocation, um, in uh, Eastern Europe or some Southern European countries even, um, you, you end up with this, this challenge of the Schengen zone again. Um, if you look, for example, at, at Portugal, uh, which engaged very willingly within the, the EU relocation scheme, um, they've had a, a huge challenge with people leaving after they've been relocated. Um, most of those who've been relocated have actually left and, and moved on to Germany. Um, so I think it's not necessarily, I think we need to be realistic about what's actually achievable. Uh, and uh, the fact that this may be um, you know, countries who actually have the capacity and experience who step forward to take on more responsibility for legal channels, I don't think that's, that's necessarily uh, a problem at the moment. And at the same time, I think also in engaging in, in legal pathways and helping to create legal pathways is also a way to begin to develop experience with asylum um, in, in sort of a small scale way. So you have seen um, you have seen, for example, the Czech Republic begin to participate in resettlement. So you can take sort of small steps, even if, uh, even if some of the countries that have traditionally been much more skeptical of asylum, skeptical in participating in legal channels, um, it's a way to, to begin to build experience, even if they may not be willing to sort of step forward and commit mm -hmm. to a mandatory scheme at scale at this stage. Mm -hmm. Small steps. And Nick, then you have okay. to answer about yeah. Thanks, Guri. So uh, I sense that you kind of buy part of the argument namely the communities that emerge in these camps, not only camps, by the way, in urban uh, neighborhoods and so on, where there are refugees and migrants and, and so on, alongside uh, citizens. Um, but the, the territory question, I mean, people don't just exist in this fuzzy transnational space, but of course they have to live in a, a physical space. So the, our sort of argument, which our fantasy, if you like, is that states might be persuaded to give up something, to, to license some territory uh, in order to deal with the develop, uh, displacement uh, challenge. So in effect, these would become uh, not sovereign, but autonomous areas. And there are plenty of examples of autonomous uh, regions and so on in, in different parts of, of the world. So they might be, so states might be persuaded in this grand bargain which we suggest might occur, were this movement to happen, uh, to give up, or to not to give up, but to license or lease territory, if you see what I mean. Um, and the Bikar Valley is also, I mentioned it in passing, I didn't have time to go into it, but this is, some aspects of that are very interesting on a transnational, uh, uh, in the transnational uh, sphere, if you like, because uh, what has happened there, if I understand right, is that uh, refugees have settled or squatted, sometimes with permission, sometimes not, with on the land, uh, essentially holiday homes uh, that uh, people in, that uh, Lebanese and Palestinians and other richer Palestinians and so on, uh, living in Canada, return to for a few months of the year. Uh, they have uh, taken up as I say, squatted or with permission, gone on to those, um, uh, those, uh, those, those spaces, houses and spaces and so on. So you can see there a kind of transnational uh, element to the 
to, the, to a kind of mini solution there. And I know, of course, Lebanon demolishes these places and they're highly insecure and so on. But I'm just grasping at a kind of uh, possible model or example of um, an instance of what we're getting at when we're talking about refugee. Mm. Thank you. Then it's you. I've forgotten your name. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. My name is uh, Vinyard. I'm from the Ministry of Justice. So I have one, uh, one question to Nicolas and just one comment uh, to Susan. And very close to the microphone. Yeah, oh. okay. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the question goes, uh, as you, are, uh, you refer to Collier and Betts, they have in their large and as your colleagues in Oxford. So uh, they have several examples in their recent books, for example, Jordan uh, and, uh, and Uganda. Just to understand what what really could be the concrete uh, concrete result of your refugia, are these examples of something like your refugia? That's uh, one question to you, because that would help me think what it's uh, it's in this concept. And you call uh, you call uh, uh, color and bits for neoliberals. Would they conceive themselves as neoliberals since yes. they have re really now produced uh, proposals for mm -hmm. a new system? Mm -hmm. So that book should be of interest uh, to, mm -hmm. to the audience. Mm -hmm. A comment to uh, legal path, uh, legal channels, certainly legal channels will, <laughs> will and have to be a, a solution. But it will be for a tiny, tiny minority. <laughs> uh, of, of, of the refugee population. Very tiny minority, and uh, it's certainly a kind of mantra in the EU at the moment, because it's also a negotiation, <laughs> it's a card of negotiations with, uh, uh, with transit and countries of origin. So, uh, just a comment, why do we really go to the big, so to the solution? with attacking the very small, uh, I think, uh, possibilities mm. for, for, for tackling the problem as such. Mm. Thank you. Mm. It was only a comment, but Susan, you should kind of regard it as a question also. This is such a small part of the whole. <laughs> but it is important that anyway, I guess you will say, yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, I, I guess there's, there's two dimensions. So if you, one is, is the scale overall. Uh, and I think uh, sh certainly at the moment, um, the number of, of people who've been admitted during, through legal pathways has historically been extremely low. I mean, if, I think the, the numbers that are usually cited by the UN are less than 1% of the, the global refugee population. Um, there's a couple of, of different dimensions in that number, though. I think, um, first of all, if, if we look at the scale of what could be possible through legal pathways versus what's being done now, I think much more could be done, particularly if we're talking about a space where, um, if, for example, Norway now has the lowest number of, of asylum claims in decades, um, a space where territorial asylum really has become even more limited. I think more is possible through, through legal pathways. Um, so the number could be could be quite a bit larger. Um, that being said, of course, it will never, we will never admit uh, or, or resettle 22 million people. That's just, that's not on the table. Um, and there are a few different reasons, of course, for that. One is logistically, the other is we can't assume that everyone wants to be resettled. Um, I think uh, the idea of mobility for, for people in need of protection, the idea that you could, could move and begin a life elsewhere, um, that has a, a bit of, um, should have a, also a notion of, of sort of um, individual self-determination as well. Um, this should be something that's accessible to people who want to access legal, access legal pathways. 22 million people don't necessarily want to be resettled. So uh, I don't think we need to be looking at comparing that 22 million number with the 1% the 
Um, it's, we're actually looking at a much smaller population than that. And then of course the, the other reason why I think this is, this is still worth considering, um, which is exactly to the, the point you mentioned, is that it, it also has political dimensions. Um, it's not just a, a tool that's been put on the table for negotiating readmission agreements, those sorts of things, um, but it's also a way from a sort of foreign policy perspective. Um, if we talk about also another idea that's been you know, batted around and discussed and, and even put into practice is, of course, expanding support for first asylum countries. And can't we just help everyone there instead? Um, politically, I think coming to the table with something like legal channels and, and offering resettlement places is sends a much different message to a, a first asylum country than simply trying to, to pay to support people there. It, it says we're, we're there as well. We're willing to step up and actually take real responsibility for, um, for providing protection in a way that simply sending aid um, doesn't convey. Um, so I, I would say that those are sort of the, the two dimensions. One is that this is also about um, providing access to other opportunities to people who may want to take advantage of them, which won't be everyone. And, and second is that I think there are real political benefits as well um, to looking at how legal pathways can be used. Mm. Um, yep. Yep. Thanks for raising the issue of the Betts and Collier, which you saw I mentioned in passing, and it, we go into it in the longer uh, version of it. For those who are not familiar with their idea, um, they look at the uh, right to work of uh, refugees, which is often curtailed, as we know, in, in both this end and in uh, places like Jordan and so on, Jordan, Lebanon and so on, um, and uh, suggest that this supply of labor could be married up with uh, special economic zones or deregulated spaces in uh, in, these, in some of these territories. And they, they alight on the example of the Zatari, the large Zatari camp in uh, Jordan, which it, by chance, as they say, uh, lies some 15 kilometers or so from a, one of these special economic zones, which is lacking in labor. So their, their brainwave is to marry up or to couple the labor supply from Zatari camp, where there is too much, labor, underutilized under, under labor, with a labor poor, uh, currently uh, lacking in labor, uh, special economic zone close by, and that uh, therefore uh, kind of mutual benefit for both. And there is a similar, similar though diff slightly different uh, example in, in uh, Uganda and other places. Um, unlike many colleagues, uh, we don't rule this out altogether, and we can, as pragmatists, we can see that something like this might uh, uh, work in, in, some, uh, in some ways, so, so refugees might work in similar kinds of zones in host societies, if you like. What, what I don't really get is the way they, they generalize from these particular examples to, to suggest that this could be a global uh, solution. I just don't see how they, they seem to say that you, come, you could come up with 50 Zataris and a special economic zone, and then, then the global uh, refugee problem would be um, solved. So, so I, as I say, unlike some people, I don't wholly uh, reject it, but I just don't see it as a, a global uh, solution. Mm -hmm. And then there is a question over there. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentations. Uh, my name is Lem Dusta, working for the churches in Norway and Europe in the areas of advocacy for migrants. Uh, my first question to you, Susan, is that I was hoping that you would touch upon some of the core problems of the CAS or the Common Asylum uh, System of Europe, where mutual recognition could have been one way of relieving burdens. Uh, Acknowledging the fact that the European countries are different and allowing the same level of freedom of movement for second citizens of the third country nationalities as a way of using those kinds of connecting points, whether family and job and other things, as, me as a means of uh, relieving uh, practical solutions for the common asylum system could have helped it, but there is a political unwillingness to sort of address the core weakness of the common asylum system, and I was hoping that you, would, you could touch into that. But I, my question to you is this concept of 
territorial asylum system. It, it is for me the first time I'm hearing the, 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 the concept. I wonder if it is intentionally meant or it is sort of a practical uh, uh, concept that you are introducing. In that you are also putting or sort of making a conflation between asylum seekers and refugees in the refugee camps in, this, in the other parts of the world. Uh, those refugees in, let's say, in Tanzania or in Uganda, some of them are seeking asylum and most of them are just in the refugee camp. And uh, Uganda for them is not a first country of asylum. It is a place of waiting until the global system comes and rescues them. So how can we look at that as asylum while uh, uh, asylum, somebody coming here and seeking asylum is the classical way of understanding asylum as it is. And in such a way that asylum by default is a territorial and there is nothing such a called as territorial asylum system. I, I, would, I wonder you would uh, comment on that. My question and the last one is to Nicholas. It's a wonderful idea of refugia. What if we use the same amount of time and intention and the same concept and apply it to the countries as they are today. A typical example is that Norway's uh, state wealth is invested in the rich countries, not in the poor countries. Why not we use the same refugee concept to improve, invest politically and economically in the countries that are conflicted in, in much of the conflicts, in more of these conflicts, our hand is involved with. So, how can we, can we, can't we solve it as it is through the system which is there instead of trying to find something utopic, which I wish it could work, but I doubt it can. Thank you. And then, uh, Nick, we will be brief now because we have one more question. Nick first. Uh, you... The, the first part was not addressed to me, the no, territorial part? Yeah. yeah, okay. Or do you want me to just refer? Uh, okay. Um, but just on that, uh, the, on this question of territory and the different conditions in uh, Tanzania, Kenya, and so on, and uh, Norway, the, the, one of the points of refugees is to draw together these different context, uh, contexts and to link them. So that would be, so in our vision, the kind of, refugee would be more than the sum of uh, the parts, mm -hmm. if you like. So it would draw together all these different um, elements. Um, I agree with you totally on investing in these, uh, in uh, yeah, the, the uh, countries of origin and, and so on. Uh, that's yeah. a kind of no-brainer. But uh, we kind of address that slightly by this idea of redistribution amongst different um, uh, differently endowed parts of refugia, if you like. So richer parts of refugia, drawing on the wealth of, say, Norway or wherever it, Britain or wherever it may be, the, the, the uh, uh, diaspor diasporic populations in those countries, uh, uh, subsidizing, if you like, the poorer parts of, of refugia. So there is a kind of mechanism of cross-subsidy in our, in our idea. Mm. So so uh, first on the, the issue of the, the common European asylum system, I think um, with regard to the, the issue of, of freedom of movement and mutual recognition, um, I guess one, one point to, to make to begin with is in, in practice, at least in the last few years, um, free movement has existed by default simply because the Dublin regulation hasn't been enforced and it's, it's proved itself to be virtually unenforceable, except in areas where member states already have close cooperation. So, um, for example, within um, the, the um, Scandinavian region, but in terms of, of actually enforcing it with entry points, so if you're looking at Italy and, and Greece, or even within the context of Germany, um, the number of cases that are actually submitted within the, the Dublin regulation and people who are actually sent back to their first entry point is incredibly, incredibly low. So in default, we've had that system. Um, I think the, the issue with, with focusing on some of, um, some of these solutions like mutual recognition of claims or, or free movement is that it's, um, it's not addressing the, the bigger picture challenge, which is the, the lack of access. Um, and the fact that, that people have to actually take their, um, their journeys into their, their own hands. If you're looking at a system where, um, where you're, you're using, relying more on legal pathways as pathways to entry, 
you're actually addressing some of those issues already. So uh, part of the challenge with free movement or mutual recognition is that someone has to actually wait to have their claim assessed before they can then begin the waiting period to get long-term residency and then free freedom of movement. I mean, it happens eventually. It's just a very long process. And in some cases, you're actually waiting years to get your claim recognized as well. Um, but if you, you take a step back, or, or rather a, a step forward, and they're actually beginning that process earlier on and entering with legal status, that begins to address some of those challenges. So I think there's, um, there's bigger picture ways to address that issue of the, the lack of, of freedom of movement or mutual recognition. Um, and then the other question was about um, the sort of meaning of, of territorial asylum, and I think um, to be a bit more concrete about what we mean by territorial asylum, it's the issue that, in principle, in, in most cases, you have to actually sort of leave your country of origin and enter the country where you want protection um, to then access asylum. And that, uh, the ability to gain protection is dependent on your presence in the territory of that country. Um, and what that means, of course, is that, again, you're, you're forcing people into situations where they may not have the ability to actually, to actually undertake that journey. Um, the, I think the, the challenge that you had referred to also is the, the issue that what's actually happening in, in countries of first asylum and the system that we're talking about here within Europe um, it's actually quite a bit different. So many countries of first asylum, you have people who are recognized on the basis of nationality or, or broad sort of conditions. Um, whereas, of course, within the context of the, the European Union, you have very individual status determinations that, that refugees go through. And, and the systems are quite a bit different. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why when we're talking about uh, sort of, uh, of access to safety, um, which is in, in many cases what, uh, what you have when people are, are fleeing en masse into a, a country of first asylum versus um, more durable solutions or long-term solutions, access to the ability to rebuild a life, you're looking at, at slightly different systems rather than trying to rely on sort of the same system mm -hmm. broadly. Yeah, thank you. Last question or remark to Andre Möckelier from LOAS. Yes. Um, to you, Nicholas. Um, under international refugee law, um, the host state takes on responsibility because the home state is unable or unwilling to provide protection. How do you view the, the relationship of rights and obligations under international law for refugia as a polity? Um, you mean uh, whether refugee would have a, it's a, a, legal, a legal system or legal standing or something like that? Well, you no. would normally have a counterpart being the, the host state, but mm -hmm. this is, refugia is sort of functioning in, in, in a space in between, yeah. and you would normally mm -hmm. have a host state as, a, as, yeah. a, as someone to, to claim your rights from. Yeah. Yeah. What would be the, the relationship and what would be the obligations on the part of Utopia? Do they mm -hmm. have obligations under international law? Do they have a standing in our, under international law? Mm -hmm. How does it work? The, well, we see that the, because these spaces are sort of aut autonomous but lying within a host state, they, they, they lie within sovereign space, people would have to be subject to those law, to the laws of that uh, sovereign nation. Uh, but we see some kind of um, autonomous setup where in which uh, rights and so on come partly from the, the host state, but also from the refugee polity itself, which, and we suggested the kind of legislature and uh, uh, m means of governance and, and so on. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'll leave it to that. Yeah. Yeah. We'll leave it to that then. Thank <laughs> you very much. Uh, you'll have a present. This is, uh, I guess you are not sure what it is. Uh, when we are hiking in the Norwegian mountains or the forest, there are no places to eat our food inside, so we have to sit down where we are, right. and then we'll sit on this one. Okay. So, thank you very much. Thank you.